So our next speaker is Joe Ecker from the Salk Institute, and he's going to give an overview of the ENCODE PI's vision for functional genomics. You've received a copy of this document and uh, by email and also in your folder. Thanks, Joe. Yes. Yeah, so I, uh, as Elise said, this is uh, a document that's been in the works for a few months and not actually seen by all PIs yet, so it's somewhat of a work in progress. I want to acknowledge uh, Brad, Bernstein, David, Gifford, Mike Snyder, John Stamp, Barbara Wald for their input. So um, this has already been discussed. It's part of the, our document as well, the, describing uh, what the accomplishments are. I don't think this was pulled out by Mike. Uh, th th this actually, I think, has a huge impact. Having uh, students and fellows attending the phone calls every other week of the analysis group or whatever group you're, 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 you're part of, I think is real value. They get to hear the discussion, the criticisms, the data presentations. It's a really different new generation of students, a new generation of way of doing science. Actually, I think it's, it's a really important aspect of the project. Uh, as was mentioned, so Mike went through the, the various um, ENCODE phases. The matrix is enormous, right? If you think about all cells, all assays, the matrix can be very large. There are some obvious things. I think the limitation in what we'll be able to do will be sort of access and reagent-based, obviously. Access to certain cell types, reagent-based. But the, the, the community will have an input in terms of development of assays that reduce the numbers of cells that I think could change the matrix. So we can't fixate on necessarily what's possible to do now, but maybe what might be possible with additional technology development. So uh, really we have, I think, so far a catalog, not necessarily an encyclopedia, right? So the definition of here of a catalog is sort of collections of of items, pictures, et cetera. We have maps, right? We have different tissues. We have maps. We also have some integration of that and the, the attempt to generate knowledge. But the encyclopedia, I think, and this is also represented in the document, is really uh, a deeper level of information about a particular element. And so I think to get to that level, you need function. You really need to assess the function of some of these elements. And that's part of where I think the PIs feel the project should go. So these are the challenges. Um, despite all the progress that you've heard about, the, the task of identifying all the functional elements is really not fulfilled yet. Uh, the more experiments they do, we actually haven't plateaued at finding different uh, biochemical regions of interest, let alone assessing their function. Um, there's uh, an unexpected greater, I would say relatively unexpected, greater degree of diversity of the numbers of and the molecular signatures that have been identified. And so that poses an enormous challenge for the next phase to try and understand how to, ad how to attack and prioritize which of these biochemical activities to address with function. And already you've heard that it's been useful, it will continue to be useful. Um, when associated with, with genetic information. Uh, so the next phase of, the, of this project must leverage and integrate a, a emerging technologies. And you've heard about some reducing the amount of samples or imaging kinds of things potentially that you could take advantage of. They, any sure I can't do everything. Um, but to attack, for example, cell differentiation in a biological context uh, the time dimension so far has really been missing from the project, and that's certainly recognized by the PIs as an area that it will be uh, of interest. So perturbation to some extent, cell differentiation um, will give us potentially new um, ways of assigning, correlating element uh, requirement and biochemical activity. So high throughput approaches for mapping genomic features. Um, uh, is going to be complemented by needing new tools that, that, that will allow us to assess function. So genome engineering and systematic functional perturbation are on the, the radar of the PIs for the possible next phase. So essentially four layers of, of information for this ENCODE 2020 vision 
uh, from elements to function are articulated. Layer one is completing the catalog of the elements. Layer two is connecting. There's some fine grain information in here that you know you could lump some of these things together differently, but I think. PIs felt that connecting elements with their cognate genes is a challenge in and of itself, that, that it warranted not being part of the catalog, but actually another unique layer of, of information. Um, and then transforming the, this catalog of elements into the encyclopedia where you actually have knowledge about a particular element in a particular cell type and its uh, function in terms of uh, regulating the expression of the gene, the the elongation of, you know, the uh, uh, polymerase, et cetera, whatever activity that has splicing, uh, assisting, and uh, other kinds of biochemical activities uh, really will um, make this catalog into an encyclopedia. Uh, and, and then really to take this to yet another higher level um, to begin to address, and I think Rick and, uh, and Mark will um, discuss some of this because it was more related to genetic variation, associating the variants with these elements and the impact on individual phenotypes and disease uh, is kind of the an, another layer that we think is going to be essential. So completing the catalog of elements is going to require new cell and tissue types. Uh, I think if you if you look at the textbooks and uh, the recent literature, you know there's about 400 cell types recognized. But um, if you look at complex tissues like brain, and you start to dissect those apart, which I'll briefly mention, it, there's likely to be many more. Um, so the number is probably much higher than that, um, depending on how you define a cell subtype. Um, new types of elements. Uh, the PIs believe, and I think that there's a reasonable expectation, that what we're pointing to in terms of what kind of elements exist is based on sort of looking back at the, at the literature and saying there's enhancers, silencers, et cetera. Um, but that doesn't leave any room for new element discovery. So there's lots of potential uh, uh, discovery of new element types, especially when you layer on uh, functional experiments on top of this. And then we really haven't, in this project, gotten into so much condition-specific uh, experiments where uh, either developmental programs, I think Aviv had some really nice papers, I think transcriptional anticipation, for example, uh, you've, a factor binds but is not needed until some later stage, will give us some more information about uh, elements that, uh, uh, that you can recognize biochemically but don't seem to have a function at a particular stage because you haven't seen the requirement for that element and, uh, uh, during development or during a stress response or uh, other kind of perturbation. So some features of what you heard in links, but more focused on the assays that the that, uh, ENCODE group is doing. So what's going to be required? Um, a new generation of mapping and discovery tools. So this is likely to help with the problem of cell diversity in terms of the numbers, so new technology should be part of the program. The, the, you know, a feature of ENCODE is, is that um, it, the kinds of experiments that are done are be typically beyond what an individual laboratory can do, and that's part of the, the interesting consortium activities. That is, there's many uh, high-throughput experiments that are done with high quality and uh, low cost, so that provides the resource aspect to the project. So maintaining, actually increasing the throughput is also a goal. This addresses what Paul said about cost, try to drive the cost to uh, down. The numbers of cells are clearly on the radar. It's challenging for some assays, but there have been improvements in the, in the assays through some of the technology development uh, groups, as well as some of the production groups and pushing down the numbers of cells that will allow you to get meaningful information from these different compartments. And then um, one important aspect is, is that uh, if assays are developed with lower numbers of cells, we don't want to really erode the quality. It was mentioned, I think Dana mentioned that, you know, the quality of the data is very high and we don't want the, 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 the you know, our drive to get, you know, one cell that without having high quality for that information as well. So although you can say it's single cell, uh, 
some of the single cell assays that have been developed um, don't really cover the genome or, or only sub subsample a fraction of the information more or less randomly in each cell. So we have to be aware of that. The other thing is, is that there are, um, this was mentioned also, so I'm sort of saying things that I've already mentioned, this, this idea of having a community focused, not necessarily in code focused data coordination center where any individual from the community can go. I think we're headed there with the DCC we have. It really is a, a tremendous resource. Uh, people I know at the Salk use it all the time, and you can go and find things, search things. But then equally, being having a similar resource that integrates the other data from the other groups in a way that allows a, a seamless sort of interaction among sort of high-level users. Hey, I don't want to have to go to all the different databases. I want to be able to pull down from this tissue, this time, et cetera, all of the raw data or the processed data. Right? So this is a, another resource that we think would be really useful. And these two resources will cover high-level users down to individual investigators. And really, the resources that are here uh, are very high quality. But if you can't utilize them, it's you know the individual laboratory can't utilize them, or like even the high-power user can't utilize them in an efficient way. That 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 detracts from some of the value. So this next layer that has been discussed um, is really trying to associate these elements with their genes uh, and, and as an important piece of information that we think is a separate activity um, related to some of the other things that are mentioned um, by Mike, for example, but these are high throughput. So these kinds of interactions are genome-wide, long-range, short-range, um, and testing some of these long-range uh, in interactions. Once they're identified, testing their functions. So some of the approaches for doing this are what's been going on is, and there are better, maybe more computationally uh, efficient ways to do this, but activity correlation, physical interaction, and then functional assays where you knock out the gene. I'll go through each one of these. So activity correlation is associating these biochemical activities with other features like promoter activity, so enhancer and promoter activity. That is chromatin marks or other kinds of biochemical activities, DNA methylation on those, and associating them together to identify cell type, tissue type selective events where you have this particular enhancer has a biochemical activity in this cell and that per, and an associated promoter, but not in that cell. So that's the kind of thing that ENCODE has been doing, uh, and these sorts of maps are activity correlation maps with different assays. The physical interactions are also beginning to emerge. Um, they're certainly used in individual laboratories and are being beginning to be uh, included in some high throughput approaches. We are directly uh, linking promoter and uh, distal elements. Some of the approaches are here. That doesn't mean these are limiting to these assays, new assays that may be equally efficient or higher resolution might be possible. Uh, and um, understanding which of these um, assays um, in which conditions are going to be useful is also potential for technology development area. Uh, and this just shows an example of uh, the kind of assay that can be carried out. It really hasn't been yet necessarily implemented in high throughput of a high C experiment where you're looking at domains of interaction across the chromosome. Um, and this allows you to begin to associate long distance regulatory elements. And that's been useful already in some um, disease focused applications. So, also, there's knockout. So, obviously, reverse genetics is focused on uh, elements. Uh, function, the functionality of elements uh, is going to be very powerful, particularly Cas9 or CRISPR or other ways of, of mutating elements. And this is being done again in individual laboratories. Uh, really hasn't yet been implemented by ENCODE or, as far as I know, other groups, large consortia, to test, for example, the requirements of, of motifs either by um, altering a motif with a specific event, a mutational event, or um, deleting completely an enhancer. Uh, this will allow us to begin to associate some of the biochemical activities with function. Where that function 
exists in the, the, the genome is going to be challenging because that element might affect the, you know, the, the activity of polymerase, whether it's stalled or, or, or not, or how, what the initiation rate, et cetera, is. So having assays that are downstream of these functional events, um, deletion events, is going to be important. Um, so this is an experiment, that obviously, that you can do in mouse. You can create um, uh, crosses and identify uh, 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 nuclear uh, deletion. You can create deletion events that are on one chromosome, so you have a, an enhancer uh, associated with a particular uh, SNP by mutation or deletion, uh, in whatever the case. You can have uh, haplotypes that are derived that are associated with, that is, from individuals that have SNPs that are associated with promoters. And this can be done either by looking at natural populations in mouse or people or creating them. And I think the point of where, where ENCODE wants to go is to begin to test these in cell models. So what kinds of models? So um, the, the challenges that exist for kind of trying to do these kinds of things are that um, where, where to look. So if you delete an element, what will be the effect of that uh, change? Is it going to be on transcription initiation, elongation, splicing, et cetera? So assays that are associated with, as I mentioned already, these kinds of functional events need to be created. Um, the, the likelihood that these um, events will, ex you know, the deletion of a particular enhancer in one cell type will have a phenotype it may be low because we're now beginning to realize there's a very high cellular and genomic sort of context for each of these elements. So deleting the element and looking in the appropriate biological setting for the requirement of that element is going to be key. So that choice of which, regula which regulatory element and which biological context is going to be critical, especially considering we would like to do this in high throughput. And then there are other kinds of um, events, uh, epigenetic events, that might not be so obvious, um, where the presence of the element, may, as, uh, as I already mentioned, uh, could be a priming event required later, or a memory event. Um, and I'll, I'll give an example of this. So one of the, one of the um, so cellular context as an example, one of the, I'll give, give an example from our group, is We've been purifying cell populations from mouse um, frontal cortex using an affinity uh, or a, uh, an affinity tag, the a nuclear membrane tag developed by Jeremy Nathan's group uh, using the method Steve Hennikoff developed called Intact, developed in a rapidopsis, um, to purify different cell populations. So we've, we've purified and looked at epigenetic marks in two different inhibitory cell populations and in excitatory cell populations. And it really clarifies what's going on relative to, for example, the whole cortex. So we're just looking at some, an example of the data here where you have whole cortex and you see some RNA expression of this particular GAT1 gene. If you then look at the three purified cell populations in replicate here, excitatory, PV inhibitory, and VIP inhibitory neurons, you can see they're much higher expressed. When you look at the methylation patterns, you can see that the inhibitory cell populations have a real signature here in the DNA methylation pattern in CG uh, and also in non-CG that don't they really exist in the cortex or even purified all neurons, new N plus purified uh, neurons. And you can see the same thing over here for highly specific VIP inhibitory expression and the co correlation with DNA methylation patterns of CG and non-CG context. So when you really identify, in fact, you can look at a much at looking at differentially methylated regions in these, if you just align them, you can see if you look at whole cortex and then you start to look at the subfractionated uh, cell types, you can see patterns uh, that are completely invisible in the, in the obviously, in the, in the whole cortex or even in purified neuron populations. So cell context uh, specific epigenetic marks um, and the, uh, really, for, for us, have put a sh shine a light on exactly what was happening in some of these that we could never get from any of the other uh, um, less purified populations. And in fact, even you can see in these populations there are of, of thousands of cells that there are subtypes in there when you actually go down and look at the reads. So also there are elements that indicate that 
that there's a memory. So you can look, for example, I'll give another example from our lab that I don't have an example of prime, but there's a memory state where you can look at these regions that Bing Ren and our group defined as called D, uh, DNA, DNA methylation valleys, or DMVs. They're very large 15 kilobase regions that are absent of, of DNA methylation, and they, they, don't, some, they don't always overlap with, with CG islands. And so you'll have a large region that in the adult then collapses in terms of the, 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 the length of the region that's not methylated. And you see, so there's so, so called hypermethylation. And so that's something you say, well, you know, that's quite interesting. What is that? If you actually look then in the cell populations, um, I'll give an example over here for this particular transcription factor. This particular transcription factor shows this hypermethylation pattern uh, in the PV inhibitory cell and in the, both the CG and a non-CG context. And if you look at the literature for that transcription factor, what you find is that that actually the precursors of the PV cells that start in this medial ganglionic eminence and migrate out, they have to express that transcription factor for a brief period of time. Otherwise, they end up in the striatum. And so we believe this hypermethylation is a signature of when the gene had to be expressed and then methyltransferase had access to that after it was silenced. And you can go through, in fact, all of these dif differential uh, methylated valleys that have collapsed and find there's a very high enrichment for transcription factors that are involved in early development. And you can look at this list and go to the literature and find where there have been experiments that have sort of looked at the lineage tracing. And you can see that there's a, there's a memory of the expression of many of these factors early in, in development. So we can see these events and sometimes they're predictive of what, what might happen to a sort of transcriptional anticipation or they're a memory of things that, that happened in the past. So connecting these uh, elements with their cognate genes uh, will require the development of novel assays of large scale. I mentioned some that already exist, but, but additional assays are going to be needed to get even higher resolution for elements that are closer to promoters. Um, systematic experimental perturbations are going to be needed to test the function of some of these elements, uh, whether it's anticipation or you can go back and, and, and test some of these events earlier in development. Um, these kinds of approaches are going to need uh, more integrated, you know, sort of integrating the function with these assays is going to require additional computational approaches which haven't been really developed for these high throughput deletion kinds of assays at this scale. Um, uh, and the challenges will obviously be how do you get this into, or is it, is it possible to develop assays um, to look at function at this scale? And um, we believe this type of effort of the development and imputation of these functional assays at large scale might be one area that, would, that ENCODE could make an impact on, just as it has in the past on other areas. Um, some of the, the, the additional areas of interest are um, the, the really transforming now the, the catalog of, uh, of, of elements into an encyclopedia. And, and some of the, the ways to do that um, are going to require classifying these elements, you know, as, you know, enhancers, silencers, or, or other, whatever that might be, based on their function. So we want to know not only where the element is, but what it's doing and how it's doing it, to some extent, and identify um, all of these kinds of functional categories beyond what we have our prejudice about existing. So there may be elements, for example, that interact with other parts of the genome. That is, not just in cis, but also in tran. They've been very difficult to necessarily identify, and, and some of these kinds of approaches may allow you to do that. Um, so that brings in the idea of really trying to interrogate the function of elements. Are they enhancers, silencers, you know, uh, um, elements that partition the genome, et cetera, by other kinds of high throughput assays. And um, some of these have already been developed, and there's reference here. Others could be developed that could test some of these functions. Uh, and ultimately, what we want to do is to understand this element functions in this context. What is the grammar of that? And this somewhat op overlaps with the computational uh, 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 program that has been initiated by NHGRI. But these would be experimental tests that would allow further computational groups to access that data. That is experimentally testing the grammar uh, in different assay systems and then allowing the 
educational groups to also work on that data. And then finally, um, this is somewhat, may, probably will be more addressed by Rick and Mark, is um, beginning to, to apply this information um, to the biology of disease, and uh, both by um, as taking the variants that are known and beginning to relate them to both the biochemical activities and these new functional assays to come up with some level of confidence that, that a particular SNP um, is going to be, uh, um, it's going to be uh, useful to explore that further. So providing some high confidence estimates of the causality of a particular SNP based on these additional assay cell types as well as the functional assays that will be developed. So we think that ENCODA's position to make an enabling contribution in this area of functional genomics, um, that the high throughput approaches um, that, that, for example, the biochemical and otherwise that are being carried out will be complemented by new high throughput gen genome engineering approaches and uh, perturbation systems. And that the importance is, is that, that, that the coordinated action of the consortium and the generation of this, date, this kind of data on a large scale will have an equal impact to the impact that, for example, Mike described for the last phases of ENCODE. So I'll, I'll stop there and uh, take any questions that you might have. Yes, Eric. Joe, I enjoyed that. This is a council question, I think. Is it, you gave these layer one, two, three, four in a very logical order in a scientific progression, but now if you were forced to prioritize them, of building the encyclopedia with the existing catalog, would that be more important than finding holes in the existing catalog and filling it with new data slash cell types? Which of those two do you think is the for the highest for priority for NHGRI. Well, I don't know if I want to. I, I put myself in conflict, maybe, if I answer that. The, so I think we we haven't fully flushed out the catalog. That's clear, but we do need to begin to interpret what these elements are doing, right? And so I think that was probably one of the biggest criticisms that Encode got. It's not that it, you know, it's not. I don't think it was ready for prime time basically, to begin to do that. We need to find the elements and assess their function. So I think it has, those things have to go hand in hand. The challenge will be, you know, accessing, you know, the tissue, some of it. So I think it can go on in parallel, in fact. I think different groups have different expertise, and I think that it doesn't have to be either or. I think the, the technology groups working in hand in hand with some of the construction groups, maybe in a closer way than has been done in the past, might allow that to, to, to merge before the end of the project. Ewan. In, um, in the association of genes with um, their elements, I, w I was sort of surprised, I was surprised not to see imaging. And was that very deliberate? Is that because it's happening somewhere else? Or do you feel that technology is not ready really for this, for this, this scale? I mean, uh, or was I, it just an omission? No, it wasn't an omission. It, there, there is, so the 4D nucleon will include that kind of imaging. I think um, it might be a little early days for the high throughput nature of the kinds of activities that ENCODE is going to carry out. It, it's possible that it could come along in the next year, oh. but I th haven't, s I think it's, it's more of a development phase. So it could be a technology development. Several RFAs have gone out in this, okay. I think. I think there was one that was part of roadmap that was for imaging of epigenetic variation during sort of a real time. I think it's one of the most exciting areas, just frankly, but I'm not sure it's necessarily implementable in uh, immediate within the next year or so, the time, time frame that we're thinking about. Jay, you're... So, I was, I was trying to understand the limitation about single cells, right? So. Your argument for stopping it, I don't remember what the lower bound was there, but um, yeah, it, was that with current single cell data, you get a sparse but rather random representation of what's going on within any given cell. For some of the assays, yes. Others, no. So but, it doesn't, I, I, might, I don't mean to say that, that it shouldn't be part of the project. I guess it's but, just but, that if you yeah. want to have the kind of comp comprehensive set. So my, my point is that it's, it's not a limitation, right? It's actually a strength because yeah. you can just aggregate 
cells that are of yeah. the same type get the same data that you would have from each of the, the subtypes. Yeah. And, and, and nonetheless also depending get on the, the breakdown, depend, right? Yeah, right. Well, depending on what you recover, if you recover 5% and then you have to do, you know, 20 cells. Oh, that, sure, but that's fine, yeah, right? Because it's the yeah. same amount of sequencing. Yeah. It's, you sparsely cover each yeah. cell. And, well, and if you want to attack the problem of, a, I should you know, let a right. speak here. Yeah, go ahead, sorry. I would just say that at the first level of approximation, that's exactly what happens in a bulk assay, except that you just aggregate the signal yeah. later. So at the very least, you would, in an ideal world, every read would be tagged for the cell it came from. You know, some of the assays are right, 500 or 1,000, or they, have, they haven't reached 5,000. So you'd have to do 5,000 barcoded. If, sam if the sample prep, if the cells, sample prep, if the sample yeah, prep cost is taken away, yeah. then sequencing-wise, it's exactly yeah, the same Yeah, I agree. I'm not arguing against against single cell, yeah. it's just that it isn't at the current cost the of what these assays are, at least current, currently. Yeah, I, I so think maybe I think the critical thing is to understand it's not the sparsity that is the issue. The sparsity, yeah. it's the yeah. sample prep. Right, you, you, you have to combine, for some of these assays, 5,000 cells is needed sure. right at this point, so. Right. Terrific. Can I, can I ask a technical question on the last two? I mean, if, if sparsity, isn't sparsity an issue when the elements you're looking at is only a KB or even smaller or could be smaller? I mean, I would think that sparsity the, the, is a very let big me, issue. Let me, let me try and, and clarify. If you take a, a, an essay, even an incredibly noisy one at the single cell level, and you aggregate the signal, you get back the signal that you get from the bulk. Well, which that, means that, that the sparsity was there all along. It was there in the bulk assay as well. It's just hidden by the aggregation. No, there, there so is the question is, would you, do you aggregate post hoc or pre? That's but, all. But there are some biases, actually. If you look at the data, for example, for single cell methylation data, it always, it always, it's biased towards specific regions over and over again in that cell. No, no, you don't. You, when, you have the, when you have the bulk, you get a much better representation. There's some stochastic events that happen in that early stage that you get the same thing over and over again. Okay, so there is, it's, not unif it's not like you're just subsampling. It's your bias sampling in those. In those. Be yeah, because, you're, because the material, the bulk in preparing the material in, in, of a thousand. It's the bio, yeah. Well, anyway, if you look at some of that data, you'll see what I mean. Yeah. Uh, yes, uh, I think the, the, the proposal is great, and, but I think we all agree that it has to move from the correlation to functional validation. And you listed in the very beginning a lot of technology development is needed. I think you didn't specify, but I feel like it, it, we need to develop heavily on epigenome editing in addition to genome editing because you're going to correlate how the epigenome manipulation correlating to the relief function. And the second comment is I think Obviously, we couldn't test all those elements. It's just impossible. So that raises two questions. One is how does those in vitro cell-generated data going to really play the role in the physiological condition in vivo? Second is how does that, uh, how do we put the perspective of evolution to really study them, right? So, so my comment is to, to, to hit both questions is have to use model organism, which is you can use evolution to prioritize. What is, I mean, it's very challenging bioinformatically, but if you can identify the top hits that's really well conserved, then yeah. that might be the I, I didn't specify if this was all human or mouse or anything. I don't right. think I had. No, I, I love mouse. So that's what I was talking about. <laughs> <laughs> and human embryonic stem cells. I think that's the two best models. Our part of the can. project of ENCODE okay. is mouse. So I, I agree right. with you, but I, I did wanted to make this sort of organism agnostic. About the epigenetic part, yes, I agree. I work on epigenetics. Epigenetic. Uh, editing will be key, and there have been some RFAs, and maybe, and there is some progress in that area as well. I didn't mean to eliminate that. I just thought, for the purposes of most of the elements that have been interrogated so far, that they're linking them to the variants is was a is a priority. Yeah. So, from uh, my point of view, one of the biggest contributions of Encode to to date is actually the technology, from the actual tech dev to more refined. Uh, ideas of best practices and protocols and, and data analysis methods. And what you proposed here is in, in large, uh, okay, let's look at all the technologies we already have and, and, and crank them, but I think the next... No, I, I, I'm, I'm sorry if I gave you that impression. That I said new technologies, not necessarily... Could you the, elaborate on some ideas of what you think some of the new technologies 
next wave should do no big, no, big wide. Uh, that's for the community to decide. I, if I if I knew that, I'd put it in a proposal. <laughs> <laughs> we are we're, there are many labs working on technologies that we haven't discussed here, but so I, I think I just put it under the category of new technology. Send the, your best ideas. Yeah. Can can I ask then in a flip side, which is also often very useful for engineers and for computational scientists, what are the biggest challenges that you would want to see solved? You know, if, if a fairy appeared and said whichever, you can choose one or two technologies that would be the most impactful for you, which one would it be? Uh, I think imaging okay. activities in individual cells over the life of an organism. <laughs> <laughs> I buy into that. <laughs> okay, if there are no other questions, I guess next up. <laughs>